ding, ding. That's the sound of the bell as the fight goes on between the devil and his demons and the children of God. I don't know about you, but whenever I'm reflecting on the temptation of Jesus by the devil in the Gospel of Matthew, I, I can't help but imagine a boxing match. Maybe I've seen the Rocky movies uh, one too many times, but I get this sense of, okay, you got the devil, the master of disaster, the king of sting in one corner, and then you got Jesus, the prince of peace and king of kings in the other corner. And the devil goes out and he swings and Jesus dodges and pounds the devil and he goes down. <laughs> the devil gets back up, wants round two, right? Comes out swinging again, but he can't touch Jesus. Jesus is dodging here and there and Jesus hits him with another one and the devil goes down, right? And then he gets back up, round three's coming and he's giving him everything he's got, right? Everything he's got and he can't touch Jesus, just left, right, yeah, he can't touch him. And then one more blow, uppercut, poof. The devil goes down. Match is over. St. Luke says that after the devil had finished his temptations, he left him for a time. Right? We know he, the devil always wants a rematch, right? So that rematch is at Calvary. Right? When Jesus is at his weakest there on the, on the cross with all that suffering, right? he attacks in, in the weakest moment, and there's that temptation. If you are the Son of God, come down from that cross that we might see and believe in you. Well, here it is, here comes the death blow, right? Jesus, by dying on the cross, destroys death. By rising, he restores our life. And now, baptized in Christ, the devil need not have any power over us. We recognize that, yes, he still, he always wants another rematch, like Apollo Creed. So, yes, the fight goes on with the adopted sons and daughters of God. The clear message of the readings today is that we are to expect temptations. Each and every one of us is going to be tempted every single day of our lives. Right? After passing through the waters of baptism, we need to pass through the fires of temptation. It's coming. We need to rise every morning ready for battle. There was a good stretch of time where I had set for my wake-up alarm, Eye of the Tiger, to wake up ready for battle, right? Bum, 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 right? We want to get pumped up for this, right? And Jesus is going to be our strength in this. And we might ask, well, why? Why does God let us be tempted? Especially if there's a particular sin we just keep falling into. We've been fighting for so long, it feels like inevitable that we're going to fall in. And we might ask, why? We might get mad at God. Well, there's a number of good reasons why God allows us to be tempted. One is to give us self-knowledge to let us know where we stand in this relationship. How deep is our love for God, right? Every temptation is a chance to prove our love for God, right? If we give in right away to the temptation, well, then we realize I must not have very much love for God. If we fight a good amount and still end up falling, okay, well, I have some love for God, but I definitely need to grow a lot more. And if we are fighting and with the help of Christ, we triumph, right, then... That's a beautiful display of the love of God and the fact that we have renounced the devil. At our baptism, there were those questions. Do you reject Satan? I do. And all his evil works? I do. And all his empty show? I do. Every temptation is a chance to renew that, for the devil to realize, yes, we have definitively renounced him. We don't want to have any part of him. God is giving us everything we need to triumph. Right? Uh, when we're, another reason why we are allowed to be tempted is to grow in virtue. Right? With resistance, like in weightlifting, uh, there, we are, we're able to grow more muscle when there's more resistance that we have to work against. And, against. and God wants us to rise to the heights of sanctity. So yes, he's going to let us be tempted. And as we grow in sanctity, as we get holier, we can expect the devil is going to attack us all the more. Right? Uh, because for him it would be an even greater victory if after we have risen some in sanctity he's able to pull us back down right? so let's not expect the temptations to lessen as we are trying to grow in holiness uh, but uh, one of my favorite reasons God allows temptation is for the devil to be humiliated when he throws everything he's got at us and by the power of Christ our cooperation with grace we nevertheless triumph 
Let us expect to triumph with the help of Christ. Uh, let us recognize in the, in the gospel, our Lord triumphed through his human nature. There was the temptation to use his divine power, but he doesn't give in to that. He triumphs over the devil with his human nature. See, part of the reason for the temptation of Jesus, the devil was trying to figure out, is this really God? Is this really the Son of God? He had heard the words of God at the baptism of Jesus. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. The devil also knows the scriptures. He knew the prophecies of a Messiah to come. And there were uh, the prophecies that he would, who, one whose existence is from of old. So now he's questioning, is this the one? Is this, and is this really God? Has he really taken human nature? Right? But Jesus doesn't, it doesn't satisfy that curiosity. He doesn't reveal his divine power. He defeats him with his human nature, a knowledge of the scriptures, and obedience to God's will. And so we can expect to triumph in the same way. We want to set our frame of mind. Giving in is never inevitable. I repeat, giving in is never inevitable. It's a temptation, a lie of the devil for us to think, you know, I... I, I always fall. You know, I, al I always end up committing the sin. You know, I, I just, I just, I'm too weak. I, it's not possible. I can't do it. Lie of the devil. Right? Giving in is never inevitable. It's one of the things he uses to try to, to get us mad at God. Oh, you're the one who lets me suffer these temptations. Well, you could just take them away from me. Uh, no, <laughs> we have no right to get mad at God. God, in every single temptation, he offers us everything we need, all the grace we need to triumph. It doesn't matter if we've been suffering from an addiction, and yes, that does weaken our will. It does uh, lessen our culpability. Uh, but let us realize, it's still possible to triumph. Giving in is never inevitable. We can win with Christ. Now, how does the devil fight? Good to know our enemy. One, he always tempts us with good things, or at least uh, with uh, a good way of looking at things. And we see for Eve, what was she focusing on? Why did she commit the sin? Oh, well, she saw that the tree was good for food and a delight to the eyes and desirable for gaining wisdom. And we can all too easily fall into this, justifying our sins. We can always think of excuses for our sins. Oh, well, it's good in this way, or it's good for, for this or that. We need to recognize, if an action is not good in every way, then it is not good at all. If an action is not good in every way, in what we are doing, the object, in why we are doing it, the intention, and in the circumstances surrounding it, if it's not good in all of those ways, then it is evil. A good intention can never transform an evil act into a good one. So we reject all excuses. Uh, there was a, an example of someone who they had committed the sin of fornication, right? taking the marital act out of marriage. And they thought, oh, wow, uh, I thought it was going to feel dirty. I thought it was going to feel uh, horrible because I know it's a mortal sin. But actually, it felt really good. Well, yes, it makes sense. The devil is going to tempt us with good things, but in the wrong context, not at the right time, not in the right way. Right? He'll, he'll present the good so that we will do the evil. If it's not God's will, right, it is, it's going to be evil. It doesn't matter the excuse. Secondly, the devil attacks us when we're at our weakest moment. Right? He looks for our, our weakest moment and, and the weakest thing about us and attacks us there. He waited till he noticed Jesus was hungry to tempt him to turn the stone into bread. Now, I always found this interesting uh, when I would read the Gospel of Matthew that he he, he points this out, that after he fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards, he was hungry. And I'm thinking, well, duh. <laughs> right? I'm like, uh, it, no kidding, right? <laughs> I, I, I'm sure I'd be hungry after fasting 40 days and 40 nights. Do we really need to point this out? Uh, but yes, he did, because uh, for people who focus on the divinity of Christ, they might think, uh, well... Uh, the, the fasting for 40 days, 40 nights, is, if he, it's going to be a piece of cake for him, and he, maybe he could go that long and still not be hungry. Right? Well, so the, the fact that he points out he was hungry is letting us, it's emphasizing, yes, he truly took on human nature. 
And so he experienced hunger. There's the revelation of both his divinity and his humanity in this. Uh, Moses and Elijah, if we know our scriptures, they had fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. And we are talking about a full fast, no food at all, right? And, and they made it. But the fathers of the church point out they were hungry during those 40 days and 40 nights, but they endured. Uh, our Lord's divinity is shown that he wasn't hungry until after the 40 days. And so that's something of God, that he wasn't hungry during that time, but after the 40 days, he allows his human nature to, to ex- he allows himself to experience it in all of its weakness. And so you know, any divine help is, is, it leaves human nature to itself. So he is very hungry. And for any of us who might have been tempted to think, well, Jesus experienced temptation and the devil tempted him, but uh, he never experienced it like I do. It was never that strong of an inclination to do what was being suggested as I am. Jesus really doesn't know what I've been through. Uh, Wrong, right? When we think of how hungry he must have been, right, after 40 days of not eating, right, he was starving, right? Uh, Every inclination of his body was to eat as soon as possible, right? Uh, That that longing for food was stronger than any inclination we might have, even the inclination of someone who might be addicted to alcohol or drugs or pornography and that it seems like so insatiable this desire and they can't fight it. Our Lord's inclination to eat was stronger than what, what we would experience as an, as an addiction. Right? That's how natural it was, that inclination to eat. And because he has his, his fallen, his human nature is not fallen, right? Uh, his experiences in the body were all the more intense than ours. So we can't imagine how hungry he was. Yes, it was a very strong temptation as far as that inclination to give into it bodily, but his will firmly set on God. So yes, the, the devil is going to attack us where we are weakest. We need to examine ourselves and ask, what is my dominant fault? Where am I weakest? That's where he's going to attack me. I need to be ready for it and set my will firmly on obedience to God. Let us look out for each other. When you see someone in a weak moment, say some extra prayers for them and realizing that the devil's probably going to attack them in that weak moment. Third thing of the devil, same old tricks, right? Same strategy that's there. First, he attacks us on the level of the flesh. And we see for, for Adam and Eve... Right, the, the three things mentioned, that it was good for food, delight to the eyes, uh, desirable for gaining wisdom. St. John the Evangelist points out these three things as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. These are the three strategies the devil always uses. And firstly, he'll go for the flesh, the body. Right? Most souls he's able to take down that way. Our Blessed Mother revealed to St. Jacinta that May, uh, more souls go to hell for sins of the flesh than for any other sin. Right? So he, he goes for the flesh first, tempting our Lord to turn the bread into turn the stone into bread, fulfill the needs of his body. When that doesn't work, when we're able to triumph over that, then he goes for pride. Right? And then he's, he says, oh, if you're the son of God, cast yourself down from here and, the, and God will send his angels. Right? This would be an act of vanity an act of of pride, of empty glory, of kind of showing off. So he'll tempt us. Oh, well, yeah, I'm not falling into those sins of impurity or those sins of the flesh and to start thinking too pridefully of ourselves. And he'll grab a number of souls that way. Then there's, after this, the, the, the sin of covetousness or desiring always more things or more glory, more riches for me. It's a way of distracting us from our call to sanctity. Another call to examination. Which one of these afflicts us the most? Is it the flesh? Is it pride? Is that what I give in to the most? Do I maybe uh, tell some lies to appear better in the eyes of others? Uh, Do I listen or or contribute to gossip so that I'll appear better in the eyes of others, be more accepted by them? What's the sin that I'm giving in to? So those are the devil's strategies, his tricks. And next comes the training. We want to train ourselves for the battle. And so we have this great season of Lent where we embrace the remedies. We embrace especially fasting, self-denial, mortification. We need to practice saying no. 
practice saying no to ourselves. When it comes to good things, things that aren't necessarily sins, like soda or candy or chocolate or any of these things, uh, we practice saying no so that when the temptations come to things that really are evil, we're able to say no. We, we have good practice in there. We're able to say it firmly, no. Right? We want to shut the, the door on the devil as soon as he's trying to, to get, uh, get his toe in there. I right? want to slam it on him at the very start of temptation. You might have given up one or two things for Lent. Well, let us not settle for that. Right? As we go through Lent, we're meant to intensify our penance. Right? To go, go for the gold. Go for as much as we can. How much can we take? Right? This is the season to really, uh, to really embrace this self-denial. We're supposed to be doing this all year. Right? All year long, we're supposed to be doing acts of penance. Every Friday especially is a day of penance. Uh, but uh, having been baptized just as a whole, we are not supposed to be focusing on self-indulgence like worldly people do, right? Just a comfortable lifestyle, right? Uh, we are supposed to be focusing on the cross, self-denial, living that out throughout our whole life, embracing the cross. Lent is just a time where we do this all the more, where we step it up, where we intensify it. So yes, let's not be afraid to add some more penances as we go along. Perhaps that uh, always useful cold shower Right? We're being tempted to a uh, sin of impurity. Well, nice ice cold shower there. Take that body. Show the body who's boss. And the, the body's like, okay, okay, okay. Forget the temptation. Just get me out of this cold shower. Right? <laughs> we got to show the body who's boss by whatever means. Right? St. Paul says, I treat my body hard and make it obey me. <laughs> we also train ourselves by reading and memorizing scripture. And our Lord fought using scripture. Right? He answered back with scripture. So we want to to re read it and memorize it. I remember reading a book that was suggesting different remedies against uh, temptations to impurity. And one of the things that I hadn't read before I saw that book was uh, memorize scripture, especially if there's been pornography, if there have been unclean sites and they're kind of burned into the mind, you know, the images, they get burned in for years. Oh, we want to burn them out by burning in scripture. Right? Memorize scripture. We want to drown evil with a sea of good. Drown evil with the sea of God's word. Right? Uh, psalm 51, a very good penitential psalm. The one David wrote after he had committed the sin with Bathsheba. Right? Memorize that one. Uh, psalm 90 is another good one to memorize. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Uh, psalm 27, the Lord is my light and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life, before whom shall I shrink? Though an army encamp against me, my heart would not fear. Though war break out against me, even then would I trust. Right? This is like the spinach for Popeye. We let the scriptures pump us up right? every day, get us ready for battle. Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. 1 Corinthians 2, uh, chapter, verse 9, eye has not seen, ear has not heard, nor has it so much as dawned on man what God has planned for those who love him. Yes, it's worth fighting for. And strategies for fight, okay, we've done the training, we're, we're practicing self-denial, reading scripture. Now how do we fight? First rule for fighting, get out of there, right? Uh, flee, run, or in the words of Gandalf from Lord of the Rings, fly you fools, right? We need to get out of the occasion of sin. Right? Uh, even as strong as our will might be to avoid sin, it's just too easy for us to succumb when we're presented with the fascination of sin. So we do everything we can to run from it. In the words of uh, Mr. Miyagi in the, Kar the Karate Kid series, right, the best strategy for a fight, no be there. Right? No be there. Right? Uh, if you recognize something is regularly an occasion of sin, no be there. Right? especially with sins to impurity, right? We don't want to be arguing with it, uh, trying to face it head on. The saints tell us to run away from this, distract ourselves, do something else. Turn the mind away. Now, what if we can't do that? Right? We do our best to avoid the occasions of sin, but what if the occasion of sin is every day there in my work, right? Maybe someone there at work. Uh, Maybe the occasion to sin is there in my home, right? Maybe not all my family members are on board with sanctity and rejecting sin. Or maybe there's regular temptations there. Uh, what do we do then when we can't run? 
We have to face this. Well, then we, we call for help, right? Call for God's help. Call on the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit you know, led Jesus into the desert and to, to, be, to face that temptation of the devil. We want to call on the Holy Spirit. Just those three powerful words, come Holy Spirit. We can shoot those out over and over again. Come Holy Spirit, come Holy Spirit. Uh, one priest said whenever he, he recognized the temptations coming, he'd shout out, Jesus, Mary, save me. Right? Jesus, Mary, save me. Right? The two that you know, Satan, he never had any power over. For sure, we, we want to call on them for their help, their intercession. Uh, we want to call on our guardian angel. Right? Uh, he will command his angels concerning you, lest you dash your foot against a stone. He does command his angels concerning us. Each and every one of us has that guardian angel, especially meant to help us in times of temptation. Call on him. Pray the St. Michael prayer. And another thing to bring to the fight, remember what we're fighting for. Remember what we're fighting for, namely love. We are fighting for love. We're not just fighting to avoid going to hell. We are fighting for the sake of loving union with God. Perfect loving union with God. That transforming union that we are meant to reach at the heights of sanctity. Right? That mystical marriage of the soul with God. Satan is not just trying to send us to hell. Yes, he'd love that. But he knows that some souls, it's just not going to happen. Well, he'll be content if he can just prolong their time in uh, imperfection. Uh, if he can, can, he can prolong that time before they become a saint, right? before we reach that mystical marriage. Even with venial sin, okay, we don't uh, end up dying spiritually, but the devil's still laughing at us because with every sin, right, we are, we're, it's, it's going to be a longer time before we reach that transforming union. Now we have more sins to make up for. So we should be as upset at the thought of temptation as a bride would be on her wedding day if some punk tries to come up and tempt her to you know, ditch this groom and, and go with me instead. And maybe that, that guy even tries to kiss her, right? She should be throwing him off. And how dare you? How dare you try to get between me and my beloved? Right? Uh, Saint Maria Goretti when she was trying to fight off Alessandro, who was trying to rape her, one of the things she said was, it would make me unworthy to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. Right? That desire for union with our Lord was a great motivation for her to fight. It would make me unworthy to receive our Lord in Holy Communion. I would rather die. Let us, cherishing that union that we are called to with our Lord, be ready to die rather than commit sin. Not just no, but literally hell no, right? Hell no, right? Because it would be hell to be detained from union with Jesus for even one more instant. Be gone, Satan. Get away. Quítate. In Spanish, get out of here. Take yourself out of here. If we fall, always get back up. Always get back up. Regular confession, devotion to our Blessed Mother, go to the Eucharist, Holy Communion, Visualize your triumph. Take a moment after Holy Communion to imagine yourself years from now, uh, or you know, by the power of God, perhaps you know, a month or so from now, right? Have, having uh, grown so much that we're so much in love that we are resisting every temptation easily with the help of God. We're so on fire with love that, no, we've rejected it. Or, you know, it's been years since I've fallen into that sin that I was addicted to. We visualize that success, that triumph, that freedom. We give glory to God and we profess those powerful words of St. Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Mm -hmm.